Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to Shiloh Chapel. Another beautiful day here in Maine. And I'm all alone in a big empty building. It's fun as being with so many of you whom I would love to see. And as many of you know, I may not be the world's greatest hugger, but I'm ready to hug all of you now. Ah! It's a good day to praise God, as every day is, in spite of all that's going on. I'll start, I'm a little early from the go time, but I want to start with a couple of announcements, which I'll also repeat at the end. Is this, if you're watching and you don't have a Bible that you think is very readable, and you wouldn't be alone in thinking that, I have some of these, case of them, and I'd like to send you one, or give you one if you can drive by. It's the Life Application Study Bible, Gospel of John. Very readable, helpful study notes. Great thing to get you going in God's Word. The second thing is, uh, Monday through Friday, I will continue to do a devotional on Facebook. And I'm calling this new series, starting tomorrow, Daily Hope, or Daily Hope in Christ, to be more specific. It will be a blessing to you. They help me because I got to do the homework <clears throat> to prepare them. So that's good for my soul. And I hope what I present will help you with your soul as well. Tonight, and you have to do this through a website. It's not on, as far as I know, any TV networks. Tonight, there'll be a special program titled Hope Rising Live. And I believe that's the website from my research. H-O-P-E-R-I-S-I-N-G dot live, L-I-V, Hope Rising dot live. And this is going to have a number of Christian entertainers, I hate to use that word, Christian musicians. The goal is tonight to raise money for an agency that I highly respect, Purse. And you can go to their website as well, SamaritansPurse.org. And they are very busy right now. They're very busy dealing with the coronavirus both in Italy and in New York. They're on the ground in Tornado Alley in uh, the south, where there's been a lot of destruction in the last week and a half. And if you want to support that organization, I just, I just think that's the greatest thing you can do right now. They are looking for volunteers in the south who can go from their homes to work in the tornado area, which means their own neighborhoods, because they cannot set up, which they would normally set up, and to have a group of people come in from all over the country and uh, support that way. So they're, they're in a difficult place dealing with this virus and their normal response work. But money helps. Money helps. They, have, they, have, they own a lot of equipment. They have to repair and replace equipment. If you can support, support Samaritan's Purse, do that. A great ministry. I'll mention those things at the end as well. <clears throat> um. This is my third Sunday being alone in our beautiful chapel and uh, trying something different video-wise as well. Hope that's working for you. Hope it's a little clearer and et cetera. Third Sunday alone in the chapel. This is weird. I'm tired of the weirdness, and I'll bet you are wherever you are as well. You're tired of the weirdness of this thing. And if you watch the news like I do, probably too much, you know that there's this tug of war, I call it, between business people and medical people. Medical people saying, no, keep the brakes on. We go too fast. It'd be a big problem. Financial people saying, look around. The economy's tanked. The government can't afford to keep this thing going artificially as they're doing now. So we have this tug of war going. And in the middle of that are us. We've got to deal with our own emotions and our families and, and all those things. So a lot going on. We need, we need God's help personally. We certainly need God's help nationally and internationally. One of the key things that helps me is being thankful. So I'm going to start with a word of prayer now, and then we will go to God's word and see how that can encourage us and help us right now. So please bow with me right there in your home or wherever you are. Lord God, it, it's a beautiful day here in Maine. I thank you for that. I thank you for sunshine. It helps my soul. I thank you for where I live. <clears throat> it's a beautiful part of Maine. I love being in the countryside here. I am surrounded by your goodness and your blessings and your favor in so many, many ways. I worship you for that. 
And yet my heart goes out to those who are right now struggling back with this virus, either physically or with the loss of a loved one, or as many are economically. There's, uh, there's huge, there are more than ripple effects to this whole thing. So we need your help. We need your grace. We need your presence as much or more than ever. We for this, but we're sense, we sense it in a different way now. Meet with us right now. Open up your word to us as I present scripture. May the listeners' and viewers' minds, our hearts and minds, be open to receive your word because it is living and active. It will help us if we make this a good few minutes together. In Jesus' name and for his great name's sake, amen. You know, the Bible sometimes repeats itself. I never repeat myself, and you never repeat yourself, but often the Bible repeats itself, and repetition, someone said, is the first form of learning. When you had to do your math, your multiplication tables, most of us had to drill them and drill them until they were automatic, and some of you didn't, and they're still not automatic, right? What's seven times eight? You, you, you'll, you'll get out your phone and try to figure it out. So repetition. The Bible uses repetition too. God repeats things that I think, he thinks, are important. Depending on how the wording is used, the Bible over a hundred times tells us to be thankful or tells us to be grateful. The Bible, because it is God's word, knows that this is healthy for us. But if you wanted health resources, Psychology Today, other medical journals, all agree, be grateful. It does something to us. Be thankful. Look around. Be thankful. But what I find interesting is who should receive my thanks? If Lois makes a great meal and she is really good, I don't thank my kids for that meal. I thank her for that meal because she made it. If someone does a nice thing to you, or gives you a gift, you give them a thank you card. You don't tell your, well, you might tell your mother about it, but my mom's in heaven, but you can tell someone else about it, but you want to, the person that blesses you, you want to give back to them. And we need to do that to our God. But my topic is not about being thankful, as important as that is. But I want to focus on one area where I am thankful and see how. My topic this morning is about water. Water. Water's good stuff, right? In Maine, we have Poland Spring. Poland Spring water. Good water. Too. Um, but Maine, in general, has some pretty good water sources. I'm blessed by having good water at my house where I live now. I grew up having good water at our home. In fact, we had too much water. The basement flooded in the spring. Good water. One of our next-door neighbors... Uh, that lived there for a number of years, moved to another community. They dropped by to say hi. I remember her coming in the house. I'm probably in my early teens, and she said to my mom, can I have a glass of water? I just love the water here. I don't know if that's an interruption with you, but my phone said pause and resume, so I obeyed my phone. Water, H2O, one of the basics of life. You need it. I need it. And we like, we like clean water, right? If you're going to go swimming, you want clean water. If you're going to drink it, you've got to have clean water. Well, I want to share two scriptures about water this morning. The first is from the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. He was not a bullfrog. I know that may come to some of your minds first, but he was not a bullfrog. He wasn't a good friend of mine, but I hope he will be in eternity. I got this from uh, one of the websites. Jeremiah's ministry was a smorgasbord of intimate hours with controversial discourses, creative object lessons, and lengthy imprisonments. A snapshot of Jeremiah would not be accurate if it pictured him as a doomsayer. The prophet spoke of a God who loved his people with an inexhaustible, everlasting love, one who was willing to forgive and remember their sins no more. This was a God who he had for them. Plans for good and not for evil to give them a future and a hope. That's in the 29th chapter. It's oft quoted. It's posted on Facebook. It's a great verse. But it's specifically about the nation of Judah. Early on in Jeremiah's book, it's a lengthy one. He's considered one of the major prophets of the Old Testament. And by the way, he's considered a major prophet not only by Christians and Jews, but by Muslims as well. 
In chapter 2, uh, Jeremiah is talking about abandoning God and going to foreign gods. And this is, I'm in the middle of the flow here, so this is what he writes. Has a nation ever changed its gods, yet they are not gods at all? But God speaking says, but my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. And then this is chapter 2, verse 13. This is the verse that caught my attention. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, to hold water. Imagine going to all the work of making something that you hope will hold water, only to find it leaks so badly it won't. It leaves you, it and you, empty. Years ago, I was over in Israel. I had a chance to hike up Masada, a mountain fixture beside the Dead Sea. And of course, it's a fortress that was built by Herod, time of Christ. And uh, it's a spectacular setup. And we walked down some stairs into this huge room that was made as a water cistern. It's a very dry land that's desert down there. Um, not that many miles south of that is a beautiful spring, En Gedi. And that, if you read the story of David, where he, had out, he hid out with some of his mighty men at that spring. And there's beautiful lush things growing by the spring. Everything else around, it's all desert. Water, to the Jewish audience, was critical. We live in New England, or you live in other places where there's lots of water, you don't think about it much. But if you live in an arid region, you do. This past week, my wife Lois finished reading aloud uh, the second book of nine by Laura Ingalls Wilder, The Little House on the Prairie. You think of the TV series, and I'll mention again, please don't. Read the books, they're really good. And in one of the chapters, Pa starts digging them a well. <clears throat> and walks a couple miles, comes over and helps them. It nearly cost his friend's life, lack of oxygen down there. But in the end, they ended up with clean, clear water. We all need good, clean, clear water. And it does help when you have lots of it. Here at the church, we have two wells out on our western terrace. Uh, they were drilled, I'm going to say, about 15 years apart, something like that. I can't remember. But the first one that was drilled... Um, didn't produce what the well driller or we hoped it would produce. In my memory, it was something like five gallons a minute recovery, which, was, which is okay if you've got a house. But when we do camping events and we have big groups, uh, it's, that's not enough recovery. So years later, we ended up adding on some more uh, bathroom and shower facilities to our fellowship hall, and we knew we'd need a second well. Well, interestingly enough, the well drillers... And they were two different companies that worked together. Not far from the first well, they drilled the second well. But this second, okay, does this resume trick? I'm not used to this. I've never done this long of a thing on it. So hopefully it doesn't, I don't lo lose you for more than a couple seconds. The second drill produces, in my memory, about 20 gallons a minute. So that's a, that's a big plus when you have a lot of people here. A lot of water, more than you need. That's something that's wonderful to have. <clears throat> I want to read the second passage, though, about water, because we want good water. We need it. We need. Most of us don't drink enough water every day, right? Uh, we're supposed to all drink more water. Put away the soda. Put away the other stuff you might drink and drink. This story is from John's Gospel, and it centers around a well. I visited this well. It's in the region. Area, Jacob's well and it's a very deep well I have no idea how they dug the thing it's now thousands of years old I'll bet they are Jacob's well so Jesus and his disciples are going through Samaria now this, just real quickly the Samarians were a mixed race Samaritans were a mixed race at this point they were both Jewish and Israeli but it intermingled with people from other nations especially in the Assyrian captivity where the Assyrians displaced people, mixed them up because that was supposedly to stop rebellions from happening from ethnic groups. So they also had a mixed religion as a result of this. They held on to a lot of the tenets of Judaism, 
but they mixed in a lot of their pagan stuff as well. So they were, uh, uh, I'll call them a happy but the Jews wanted nothing to do with them because they were a mixed race, because they were a mixed religion. The Jews wouldn't hardly give them the time of day, but it was the shortest route between north and south in Israel. It was through there. So Jesus and his disciples are going through there. And I'm in chapter 4, and I'll start reading, let's say, at verse 6. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then, it's right in the text, For Jews do not associate with, some, associate with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Zerlin said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? <clears throat> Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw. And I think I'll stop then talks to her about her personal life. He knows all about her past. He is there to forgive her past. A lot of dynamics going on, cultural dynamics in this story. The previous chapter, by the way, Jesus is questioned by Nicodemus, leading male, all the Jewish leaders were male, leading male Jewish person, authority, power. He talks to Jesus. Now Jesus is at the other end of their social spectrum, so to speak. But both people are looking for the same thing. They're looking for something that they living water. Now, Jesus is, he's, he's not made it as clear as I wish he had there to it. What Jesus is talking about is not a physical thing as important as physical clean water is. This is a spiritual topic. And therefore, I believe even more critical as you and I are eternal beings by design. Unless you have, unless I have this living water, we are dying spiritually, little by little, day by day. But if you have this living water, you will never die spiritually because this water is Jesus. Now, how does this play? That all may sound good to you. That may all sound strange to you. I don't know. Depends on your background. Depends on your experience. But I want to try. Um, there we go again. Resume. I want to try, figure out how this works in everyday life. Okay? Struggle with uncertainty. And our uncertainty now is twofold as I started at the beginning. We have the, the physical threat of this virus, which in our region very, very slowly moving, and I thank God for that. We also have, we don't know, financial uh, repercussions to all this. Time will tell on that one. And I'm not fear-mongering here. It's just reality. That's where we live. So I've got several points down here. You will experience problems and struggles, whether you have Jesus or not. I'll repeat that. You will have Different kinds of problems and struggles, whether you have Jesus or not. That's life. That's life in this fallen world. That's a whole other topic. But um, people get confused. I'm a Christian. I won't have any more problems. Isn't that what the Bible says? Nope. It's not what the Bible says. Somebody telling you that on something, don't buy it. It's not so. The Bible talks a lot about the struggles of this life. And, this is key, how God wants to struggles to draw us to himself, to draw you to himself. So we learn 
that when we work hard and think, this is going to make me happy, I'm just hewing out, as Jeremiah says, a cistern that holds no water. But when I come to Jesus, I find something I couldn't find anywhere else. Another way this plays out, <clears throat> and I think especially in my years of dealing with elderly people and as a pastor, sometimes sitting with them, talking with them, lives, and they reflect with their lives. There are a lot of things that come to the surface at that point. Um, I've been with elderly people that were pretty reserved and they kind of talk openly at that point. I, I, let's face it, what have they got to lose? They talk openly. But, but I think those that have known Jesus, this theme keeps coming through. They've never been alone. They may have gone through lonely experiences. They may have lost a loved one. Their spouse may have passed on before them. But they knew they weren't alone. The living water that Jesus talked about is in you. Water is in you. That's pretty powerful, living water. Another one is one of my favorite words from the Bible. It's called hope. Hope, H-O-P-E. My hope for the future, regardless of physical and financial, those two big things doing the tug of war all around us, I have hope because my future is secure. My future is secure. It's in Christ. My future is secure in Christ. Is your future secure in Christ? It's almost like an offshoot from it, but the Bible describes them independently. You can have peace and you can have rest. You can have peace and you can have rest. Why? Because Jesus is with you and Jesus is in you. The living water of Jesus, and that is there. You have Jesus. Jesus, through his spirit, is in you. In my notes, those are capitalized. In you. Jesus himself. I was reminded of a verse <clears throat> that I used to see at least every week, usually several times a week. As I spent pastoring in Northfield, New Hampshire. I was a youngster back then and still, like now, have a lot to learn. But on that sign, we had part of Matthew eleven twenty-eight. And so I'd see that sign every time I drove into that little church. And it still sticks with me because those words are so true and are so needed today. Where Jesus gives this great invitation. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you, many of you know the next word, rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He said it twice now, rest, rest. Why? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You and I sometimes are the to carry. Um, my wife is now reading Pilgrim's Progress in modern English. It's in Elizabethan slash Shakespearean in English, but she's be, I'm reading little bits of it. She's zipping right through it. But he loses, Christian, the main character in this story, loses his burden. Jesus takes our burdens. We can find rest in him. My burden is light. We need to come to him. We need, just like regular water, we need to drink from Jesus daily. Yes, we have him within our hearts, but we need to drink daily. And uh, uh, from the Jesus Calling devotional in yesterday's reading, the author, Sarah Young, points out, Manna didn't keep. You remember the story of manna with the Israelites? They're 40 years wandering in the wilderness. God fed them this miraculous, weird stuff that we still don't know what it is. But if they took too much and tried to keep it to the next day, it rotted. Except Friday, Friday they were to gather twice as much and it would keep over Saturday. It was miraculous. No two ways about it. The manna didn't keep. You needed to get the new stuff every morning. And I think Jesus is calling you and me, especially at this time, to sit down with him in the morning and drink. Sit down. Find something living and powerful that only he can give. Will you still feel anxiety? Yep. Will you still think, man, there's more challenges than I can handle? Yep. 
that's part of life. That's where we are right now. But you'll never be alone. You will have Jesus in you, helping you, answering you. Uh, one of our Amazon that we received was from Frito-Lay, a box of the little packages of chips. Those are great sustenance food. I'm sure most of you think we could have done worse. But anyway, I was fascinated what was on the outside of the box. This phrase, handle with care, there's joy inside. Handle with care, there's joy inside. That's your theology today from Frito-Lay, the, the potato chip, corn chip maker. Handle with care, there's joy inside. You and I today need to handle our families with care. More stressed and strained than I am, than you are, and we need to be gentle and say, come with me to Jesus. His is easy, his burden is light. Let's drink of his living water. Let's find what we need from him. Handle with care, there's joy inside. I'd like to close in prayer. Uh, then I want to mention a couple things. I mentioned I'll re rephrase a couple of things I mentioned at the beginning in case you missed them. <clears throat> Please bow with me. Lord, um, we're all tired of this whole thing, and we want it to be over with. We wish our government leaders uh, could get a better grip of what's going on here. There's a wide range of opinions on that. But I do pray for them every day, as your word tells us to do, pray for local all the way up through national, that they will be guided and we will get through this map. For today, we need to come and drink from you. I certainly, I did this morning, but I do now. I drink from you, Jesus. You are my living water. You're my source of life. You're my source of hope. You're my source, source of peace. You're my source of rest. And Lord, forgive us when we try to find those things elsewhere. We're hewing out cisterns that won't hold water. Doesn't work. Help us to smarten up and learn that. It only works for you. I pray for faith and encouragement for my friends listening, friends and family. God, you know what, what their needs are better than I do. Meet them as they turn to you. They'll find you real. Maybe there's somewhere that says, someone listening that says, I don't know if I have Jesus in my life. Well, you can. Say, Jesus, come into my life now. Forgive me. I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. Be my Savior. Help me to walk with you and grow with you and drink from you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, please let me know. I want to help you. So this is one resource that I think very highly of. It's the Gospel of John, Life Application Bible. I've got a bunch of them. I want to give them away. I'm not looking for money. If you send me a case of toilet paper, I'll be grateful toilet paper. I'm all set. But if you want a gospel of John, there's great study notes in there. They will help you in your walk with Christ. Or maybe you know someone else that could. I will let you have one. Monday through Friday, I will be posting uh, a short devotional every day. I'm calling this new series starting tomorrow, Daily Hope, Daily Hope in Christ. And I hope those few minutes, that they last about two to three minutes, will help just give you a little breath of fresh air, say, yeah, go, go. and uh, we, can, we can get through this. Then tonight at 8 o'clock, uh, only stream, only stream via, in, via internet, is a program called Hope Rising. It's hoperising.live, all across, hoperising.live, or you can go to samaritanspurse.org, and at samaritanspurse.org, you can click and link it from there. They have a lot of uh, Christian musicians on there and presenters. It is a fundraiser for Samaritan's Purse and the amazing work they've been doing both with COVID-19 care in New York and in Italy. And also right now, their hands are very full trying to help families in the South and Tornado Alley that have had a lot of destruction. I last count, there were over 30 deaths from those tornadoes. So they're trying to work there. They can only work with people who are local that can drive in and can they are not allowed to set up camps yet. Um, so they need support, samaritanspurse.org. So that's tonight at 8 o'clock. Enjoy the rest of your day. May God's presence be with you. May you find his grace and peace very real. Hope you can get outside, do some walking or yard work or something. God bless you.